Welcome, guys, to the Unashamed Podcast with Phil Robertson. Uh, Al Robertson here. We're going to have Jace today as well as Phil, of course. Uh, it's his podcast. Uh, we're going to be talking about the reliability of the scriptures today, really how they have motivated us to, to live the way we live and to do what we do. Uh, so I think it's going to be really, uh, you're, you're going to enjoy it. It's an interesting discussion. Uh, we may even talk about old sleepy Joe Biden. You never know what to expect. So glad you're here. I am unashamed. What about you? So dad, I never thought that, uh, you and, uh, Joe Biden would be, in a lot of agreement just from following uh, his uh, his politics and, of course, uh, listening to you for all these years. But recently he said uh, that in America we are – we're fighting for the soul of America. That's that's where we're at. And basically that is, is the premise of your new book, The Theft of America's Soul. So you and Sleepy Joe uh, apparently are in agreement. I, I didn't think I would live to see the day when a – spokesman for the Democratic Party would be talking about being in a battle for the soul of America, one, and two is I, Joe Biden, am here to to make America moral again. And I'm looking at the Democratic he Party. Said that? Huh? He said that? Yeah. Hmm. He said, I'm here to make America moral again. Trump wants to make it great again. I want to make it moral again because the Democratic Party is the entity that you look toward to practice moral behavior, as in love your neighbor, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, that's what the Democratic Party, that's been their mantra. I haven't heard the Democratic Party say a kind word. In fact, I have not heard the Democratic Party in the last decade say one word, even mentioned the word God. And I have not heard one of them at any time in any debate on any TV show say the words Jesus Christ. I haven't heard them one time, but they're going to be the moral standard for America. They've slaughtered 60 million of their own children, champions of it. The Democratic Party are the ones who have run God out of our schools. The Democratic Party pushed this narrative that marriage is not between a man and a woman. 7,000 years of history, biblical history, we look back, one man, one woman from the beginning for this reason, you have a male and a female. That's in doubt with the Democratic Party. No such thing. You can be a man or a woman just whatever day you wake up and decide what you are. So you look at all that, and Joe Biden has come down from somewhere, come out of the woodwork. Delaware, I think. <laughs> Delaware. <it>. Delaware, <laughs> and he's going to be the standard of morality. He's whispering to Barack Obama on stage in front of a lot of people, this is a big effing deal. I'm like... What kind of individual would use that terminology and go to quizzing oh, no, us I'm and not. telling us I'm the standard of morality in the United well, States? I'm going to make you feel better. He's not going to win. <laughs> he's not going to win. So he, I'm, his, I'm he's basically it. saying I'm going to be the moral, you know, I'm bringing back morality. And the, I heard him speak five minutes about how terrible the tax cuts are so oh, I mean yeah. that's his big deal. I'm gonna raise your taxes and I'm gonna bring you some morality from somewhere. He's you know, so I'm sensing some doubt on Dad's part that you know Biden would really make America moral again. I was thinking about the acronym. You know, it's MAGA. You know, we hear MAGA because now it's everywhere. Make America great again. Make America moral again is Mama. Yeah. And when I when I thought about that, I just thought of Mama. You know, it's like a, it's such a weak. You know, I don't know. Just the whole idea. It's Aeros, almost laughable. I was thinking really. of the Aerosmith song, Mama. Isn't, didn't that have to start off? It is. <laughs> it is interesting. <clears throat> Maybe Joe, in a moment of weakness. <clears throat> Maybe Joe, in a moment of weakness actually sat down and read my book, The Theft of America's Soul. Maybe he did. I'm, a, I'm blaming it on the devil. 
you could add working in and through the Democratic Party is the reason we've been on about a 60-year no God allowed in anything. I saw them cheer <clears throat> like at a ball game. They were jumping and cheering when they got the news that we can now kill children even after they're born, just put them on a table and let them die a slow death. I heard them cheer when they heard that news. That's terrible. It's, it's, and they're now going to be the standard of morality. Well, I certainly, God help us is all I can say. Well, I will say dad that I've, and you know, we've all written a lot of books. Jace, you wrote a book. Uh, <gasps> Man. Good no. call. That was, it's, it's easy, isn't it? Right. No. But, <laughs> you know, they give, I had a ghostwriter. He interviewed me and, no, I wanted to share my faith, share what was going on. And I read the first chapter after, after I was interviewed, and I thought, this won't work. I guess I'm going to have to write this myself and then send it to him and say, what do you think? You know, take care of all the English part of it, the correct grammar. And that's kind of the system we did. I wrote my book for two months in between the hours of 11 at night and 4.30 in the morning during duck season. So then when I would finish, I would just come duck hunt. So you say, well, when did you sleep? I really didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to edit in the whole process. Well, so this is like Dad's third book. But I have to say, um, out of all the books we've done, I mean, Dad, this is one of the best we've done so far. And, and you know, no a, doubt. a lot of them were I, about the stories. Yeah, I promoted your book because I read it, and I thought, now this, this well, is Well, and awesome. the timing of it, you know, in terms of where we are, culturally had a big part of that too so um you know we've been and phil shows his softer side he does know. he does there's a softer side of that you, you should see where we started with the book that we, <laughs> where we wound up here it, it started out a lot more harsh uh, than it wound up i think we need to all remember in the context of us beginning a long detailed study of the bible peter said this he said First, he said, in First Peter, he said, uh, no, it's in Second Peter. First, he, Peter said, in Second Peter, uh, we have the word of the prophets made more certain. And you can begin with Moses, who wrote the book of Genesis. And you'll do well to pay attention to it, the Bible as a light shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. <clears throat> Above all, you must understand, not you are to, not you should, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture, when you go back to Genesis and the opening line of this book says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Start there. It tells you where the cosmos came from. You either believe it or not. Some believe it, some don't. But Peter said, roughly by my count, about 5,000 years after he was, after that opening line in the beginning of what Moses wrote, God created the heavens and the earth. He said, You must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. Peter was saying Moses just didn't dream this up. He wasn't a world traveler, he jumped on a boat and looked around at the oceans. He's fixing to talk about the land came up and then there the seas. This wasn't a world traveler. He's just sitting out there under a tree writing down what God told him to write down. Right. And you're like, 5,000 years later, Peter alludes to that. He said, you better pay close attention to it that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. Moses didn't dream up the Genesis account. Peter said God told him what to write down about it. For prophecy, what we're going to be looking at from this day going forward, never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God, Moses speaking on behalf of God, as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Any way you want to slice it, to write a continuum beginning with where the cosmos came from before it gets to all the things you see in the cosmos and the earth, it's pretty remarkable, Al, 
that over 5,000 years of writings, the material they covered and the depth of which they, they went to show you a historical lineage of a people, a group of individuals, people who live by faith, the God of, of the cosmos of creation working in and through them, and you finally get the Savior of the world. Genesis 3 says he's coming. Someone from a woman will crush Satan. And then it portrays this picture, cosmic struggle between good and evil. Right. And you look at all that and you say, all these guys who sat down and the ones Peter are talking about, about 40 in all, to come together and put a story together with this kind of breadth <clears throat> and length right. with the with what it covers every possible issue that you've ever entertained. Where did the cosmos come from? It answers that. Where did we come from? It answers that. Right. What are we doing here? <clears throat> it answers that. Yeah. Uh, is there a way out of here? <clears throat> it answers that. And you just put it all together and you say, wow. It's amazing right after that. Peter goes on to say, there were also false prophets among the people during these writings, just as there will be false teachers among you. He said, a lot of falsehoods will come your way in lieu of all of these scriptures. You will see falsehoods. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies they won't hold to what's written here. They will try to circumvent it. Even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, they will deny Jesus Christ. They will scoff and laugh when they hear about someone actually bowing down to him. They'll be there bringing swift destruction on themselves as punishment. Many will follow their shameful ways when they twist and distort what is said in this book and they will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, he mentions these people who will come up with these uh, false narratives other than the Bible. They're doing it in their greed, meaning money-making enterprises. If you look carefully at what the Democratic Party is saying to us now, I just characterize them as false prophets because notice, Al, We'll control the climate. We literally will, in control, will control the thermostat of the, of the earth. We can do it. And all it's going to take is $100 trillion. You <laughs> give that to us and we will control the climate and we won't be destroyed by the climate in the next 11 or 12 years. Peter covers all that about, don't listen to him. He ends up by saying, look... The day of the Lord will come like a thief. We don't know when he's coming, but he's going to come down and destroy this whole thing, replace it with a new heavens and a new earth, and the ones who have stuck to the scriptures will be part of it and will live forever, and immortality is yours. But Peter actually supported global warming there in Second Peter 3. He it actually was just did. at a later date. He said, you want global warming? Yeah. <laughs> You're fixing to see it one it day. one of these... <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It's all so, going to burn. Well, you know what's ama more amazing to me is that you quoted Peter, what he said about the Bible itself, yeah. and, and described that, you know, 3,500-year tradition of all these different writers that wrote the Bible. Yeah. But this is coming from a guy who was so, uh, you know, afraid uh, in his setting because when Jesus died that he basically turned his back. This is one of the heroes <laughs> of yeah. our book, he turned his back on Christ, yeah. you know, and had to be reinstated, which again, I think it shows the interesting part of the Bible is the people that we look to that wrote this were flawed and talk about their, you know, humanity. It's not like, you know, most of these things in other world religions are some prophet that's up here and then he... You know, passes this down to you. The, the Bible, or they have some narrative somebody wrote, right? But they don't have a book this sophisticated over four or five thousand years of writing with right. forty different people that all seemingly has the same theme. You know, once you study it, and that's why people the first thing they do is attack it. I mean, they'll take that. You'll read that passage in Second Peter, and they're like, "Yeah, but he wrote that." You know, how do you know, right, that he wrote this? Plus, you got to remember. So, you got to remember, 
and everyone needs to understand this <clears throat> because we hear all this uh, <clears throat> talk of anti-Semitism, and you say, I wonder why there's so many people that gather together and they hate the Jews as much as they do. The Theft of America's Soul is a book about the, the one who stole it, is in the process of stealing it, you say, is the devil himself. Well, isn't it amazing that when you look at the Bible, all these people who wrote this, Al, they were all Jews. The Jews wrote the Bible. Right. You're like, God worked through one group of individuals. Abraham, the first time you see Hebrew in the Bible, you say, Abraham the Hebrew. Well, the, the patriarchs, Jews, mm-hmm. the promises, the covenants, all Jewish. All the prophets, Jews. The apostles, Jews. Jesus Christ himself, Jew. Well, do you? if you've ever wondered, I wonder why there's this in, incessant, continual attack on the Jews. If you look at them over there, they're camped out on a little sliver of land in the middle of, I mean, the Middle East. Their enemies are all around them. Oh, but, I've been there. Oh. We, we got up on the top of the Sea of Galilee, and our guide said, you can look right here, and there's, I think he said, 60 different terrorist groups in, yeah. in your vision off in on that horizon. And here's my point, Jace. <laughs> look, Al, you say, I wonder why they attack the Jews like this, the evil one working in individuals to attack the Jews, the Jews. Well, I've just told you where all these writings come from, all Jewish the salvation of the of the of the world, Jew and Gentile. Remember, God told Abraham, all nations will be blessed because of you. Right. So the Gentiles were grafted in, and here we are, thanking the Jews for what they brought to us. And what's amazing is you're saying, boy, no wonder they attack them. No wonder they attack well, them. Well, yeah. Here's they... the deal: they're still here, Al. That's right. They're still here. But they're thinking by doing that somehow or another, it negates what the Bible says. I mean, anything to attack. I mean, he basically chose to dwell in a nation to show what he was like. He he wanted that relational aspect. Everything in the Bible has its shadow from the Old Testament to the New Testament. You know, he, he wanted to, to dwell with people. But through that, without Jesus, obviously— under law, it just showed the need for a savior, which right. God had in mind. And then we become Jew and Gentile later on in the New Testament, the holy nation of God, which was the whole plan all along. But people, they never get past the Old Testament. That's why when I tell people when they say, you know, I'm going to read the Bible, people are not familiar with it. And I'm like, well, how about starting the book of John? Because most books you start in the beginning. The problem is, if you've never read the Bible, when you get to about Leviticus and uh, Deuteronomy, (laughs) most people say, I'm out. It's scary. It's law. It's about Jews. It's confusing. They're like, well, wait a minute. And it just showed you that you couldn't make it on your own. We need to keep in mind as Gentiles what the Apostle Paul told the Romans. He said, uh, you do not support you Gentiles. You don't support the root, but the root, the Jews, supports you. You Gentiles will say, but branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. A lot of them rejected the, their Messiah when he came. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand, you Gentiles, by faith. They were broken off, the Jew. Do not be arrogant as a Gentile being brought into the Jewish tree. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. And watch this. For if God did not spare the natural branches, the rejection of Jesus by the Jews, he will not spare you either. So what he's saying is the Jewish root is the root of the tree. We were branches just grafted into the tree. Be thankful to the Jews and never malign them. You better speak well of them because they're the ones who brought you. Well, because they brought Jesus. That's what, you know, I, I go around, I explain, because most people look at the, the I, you know, like me, I thought the Bible was a rule book or perhaps 
the arguments I've had, people think it's a collection of fairy tales that just happen to kind of have some way to connect it all. But what I learn is it's it's a revelation from God that reveals that he actually desires relationships with his creation and people because it's we're made in his image. So I'll explain it this way. Genesis to Malachi, Jesus is coming. Because the Old Testament proved one thing. You can't keep the law perfectly. God is perfect. So we have a problem. So we need Jesus. He's coming. Matthew to John, he's here, which his whole plan was to reveal what God was like in human form and then to actually take care of the problem of the Old Testament. We can't keep the law, so he dies as an innocent sacrifice. Then you got Acts to Revelation, which says he's coming back. I mean, the whole Bible, that sums the whole thing up right there. Right. So then that makes you think, well, why is it so focused on Jesus? Because he is the image of of the invisible God, John 1, 17. I, I thought of an interesting passage in that vein. John, when he ran upon the Jews in John 5, he made an interesting statement because they had put their faith and trust in Moses. And he gets to the end in chapter 5 and verse 39. It says, you diligently study the scriptures, which is what we're talking about, because you think that by them you are you possess eternal life. Well, when you read that, you think, well, yeah, that's what I think, just like they did. But Jesus was chastising them because of the next sentence. These are the scriptures that testify about me, yet you refuse to come to me to have life. So his point was, you can know the Bible. You can even put your faith and trust in it. But if you miss Jesus and the relation relational aspect of it, oh, you missed it. Yep. It's like the guy who memorized the Bible backwards, and you know, which is would be an incredible feat. Which is the point. Which means of, nothing. Which <laughs> is the point of Romans 9 that says, don't be arrogant about that, yeah. the way some of these people felt yeah. and rejected Jesus and said, no, we'll stay under the law of Moses. And, and God said, oh, I'm delivering you from the law of Moses. I'm putting you under grace. It's not by works. When people see that, we don't need to be having just read what Jesus said that it would be easy, I can say, how you would be mad at the Jews for the because they didn't embrace Jesus. What we need to understand is we need to love all men, <clears throat> That's right. especially the ones who brought us because it seems to suggest that there would be more. There's a lot of Jews now who are Messianic Jews who have, in fact, embraced Jesus in the United States for sure, right, and over in Israel too. So we need to remember those people to say, well, you know, give them some time. That's right. Well, just and and you're right, Dad. I mean, it has to be based in the idea of loving people. You know what we've seen. We know some guys that are that are working in Athens with. You know, there were so many refugees that came through from the Middle East because basically it was it was Islam against itself. I mean, these people were all Muslim, but they had to go because they were being treated so badly by other Muslims. But we, we've, what we've seen is, is for the first time, there are many um, who have grew up and were born into Islam that now are ready to embrace Christianity. They're like, we found no answers there. Throngs of them. Throngs of them. Because, of them. because And again, that's not just a slam on Islam. That's saying anywhere a religion that doesn't understand Christ and redemption, that's the whole thing. That you always wind up in a bad place. Yep. And so that is what makes the Bible unique. There's a faith aspect. But then there's a lot of facts about the Bible that we've been talking about. I mean, it, it was written over a 1,600-year span. Think about that, generations. Oh, six, I thought it was 4,000 years. Well, you, that Three. much history. But think about it. Moses came along quite a bit later. He's the first one that wrote the Pentateuch. So it wasn't really written over as long as you imagine mm -hmm. that it was done. I mean, because it was still, just— Still, if you took 40 people over a 1,600-year period and just said— write your thoughts about history and life, and then Ooh. you go back and read it 1,600 years later, it would be impossible well, that, for it to have any... That would. Can you imagine? But, Jace, look at our lifetime. Look at how history in our own lifetime... Mm -hmm. We're talking 50 years for Dad, 70 years. Look at now. People look back on stuff we know happened, and they're like, well, no, that that's not the way that went down. I mean... We can't even span a hundred years without 
a change in historical fact because it doesn't fit now the modern narrative. That's true. You know, we were talking about this with Disney movies. You know, there's the recently I ran across uh, it was it was called Song of the South. It was really it was Disney, but it was 1946. You had Uncle Remus and all these different things that are in it, things that could never be done today, because it's like we don't embrace that history. That that's not the way. It, and it was a very endearing tale about it. Uncle Remus was an awesome man that accepted everybody, but now it's like oh we can't talk about that because that was an era of racism or whatever. So I, what I'm saying is we can't even live up to our own history in a hundred years. And yet you see this spanning all these generations with all these different writers. Uh, you know, it was think about it. It was 40 different authors, Kings, fishermen, you know, I mean, uh, peasants. Yeah. People that really weren't writers. That's right. Yeah. This wasn't <clears throat> a lone individual in a cave somewhere coming up with a few musings that he's fixing to write down. That's right. This thing is way beyond that. Expansive, which I think is important because we talked a lot, you guys have both talked a lot about the faith aspect of it, but then there's a lot of there's a lot of facts about the Bible and the truth of it. Arche- archaeologically, it continues to be the most consistent guide for archaeology. I mean, that when list. I went to Israel, I mean, you're, you read, you look, you say, oh, okay, I get it. it it's not like it was because people want to make it fantasy land. But if you're just not a believer in God and you're you're looking at it without an open mind, you, you just try to find something. You know, the ark wasn't big enough to hold all the animals or whatever right, they, right, you know, right. they come up with. I'm like, you know, I think they're just giving us the high points of what happened here. But, you know, when you start looking at how they found, you know, fish fossils in weird places, you think, well, maybe there was a flood. <laughs> but... But my point is, you're not going to prove it anyway. But when you look at how this book has survi- survived, I'm pretty positive it's the number one seller of all time. Oh, and still it continues we'll, to be we'll every never, year. And look, people, they've tried to burn them. You know, e- even Hollywood. I, I thought about that movie. The, have you seen that uh, movie, The Book of Eli? Denzel yeah. Washington? Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's one of the most spiritual radar movies I've ever seen. It is. I, I, I mean, it, it's awesome. Yep. You know, he's blind. But he had the Bible in his mind. He was carried along by the Holy Spirit. So when these guys tried to attack him, you know, he was like the greatest fighter of all time. Because <laughs> it was He's a, blind. It was a, well, right. And the, God was, you And know, the trick empowered. on the movie was you didn't know he was blind until like at the end. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm ruining the movie for everybody, but if you hadn't seen that Well, right now, you should have already seen yeah, it. Yeah, you know, I mean, come on. It's, but the point being, look, I'll just put this group of people together telling the same story. Kings, philosophers, fishermen, just go from kings to fishermen. You're like, <laughs> what in the world? But that's my point. It's about somebody. It's a letter from God that's personal. That, and that's where people miss it. They just think it's a rule book, so they start reading and say, I don't get it. Right. No, it, it's actually about somebody that you can, and the you can have a thing it, with. Right. Here. And the people who wrote it were not like a a little selected group that God had picked. I mean, this fisherman, peasant, statesman, scholars, you like all these different individuals are going to sit down over 1,600 years and come up with the same story, Yeah. not even being able to say, talk to any of them. You know, they didn't know where interaction. They just, the next one would come up, he'd write some more, and then the next one would step up, and he'd write some more, and you end up and read it and say, man... You talk about the greatest story ever told. How in the world did they do that? It, it would take divine intervention, in my opinion. Well, we think about it. We, we mentioned Peter and his lack of character, and then he became the pillar, literally was the first guy that preached the first gospel sermon. Well, think about the other, the most prominent writer probably in the entire Bible, Paul. A murderer. A murderer, a terrorist, and look, and was a Jesus, and you mentioned you know Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus was constantly chastising the Pharisees because they missed it. They knew they did know the scripture, but they yeah. didn't know him. Well, that's who Paul was too. Yep. This guy was a converted Pharisee. He oh, called himself the okay. Pharisee of Pharisees. So your your main star was your biggest enemy when Jesus was on. I mean, it's, it's one thing it blows your mind. But even that makes me think of that verse. Even the evil one himself was the verse where he said he masquerades as an angel of light and his servants as as angels, 
uh, of righteousness. Yeah. Where's that in Second Corinthians? Mm-hmm. Or I mean, you tend to think of the evil and the devil out there in the world and some kind of sinful is, but he actually masquerades a lot of times in religion itself. And when you Big see time. what Jesus had the the most problem with, I mean, it was religious people. Yeah, even when we're you know when I was in Israel, right. you know once we crossed that border, we went into Bethlehem, and there's a guy down there who's following Jesus, and pretty well surrounded by Muslims. And uh, we get to the, and that we didn't meet on a Sunday morning because they said you know you got a pretty good chance of getting bombed if you meet on Sunday morning. So they change it up. Of course, I'm looking around like, well, what are we doing here? <laughs> so we got in there. The first thing he said, they had just remodeled the place because they had their 14th bombing. They survived their 14th bombing. And then I was really looking around like, well, <laughs> what are we doing here? <laughs> Netanyahu said this, a square mile here is probably the most dangerous piece of real estate on the planet. Yeah, Yeah, but it's in the name of religion. You know, but he said uh, this guy, the preacher, they had tried to kill him on several occasions. He took five bullets in the chest and lived. Well, it scared them because then they thought, I mean, if the man survived five bullets, maybe he is with God, you know, and it, then America found out about him. So now they don't want to, you know, make America mad. So they're kind of leaving him alone. They're doing other things that are less violent. So he said what they started doing is every time they would have the service, they would pull up with loudspeakers and drown him out. You know, he's preaching, and they're playing these, you know, all whatever the, you know, their religion is. And so he said, I didn't know what to do. I was stressed out about it. I was talking to God about it. And he said, and then I was praying one night, and he said, and God answered my prayer. It was by bigger speakers. <laughs> And so now he has speakers on the side of that church building that go for five miles. The sound travels. Was, he's one of the most courageous people oh I've ever met in my life. Yep. He's he's not getting off Jesus. He believes in the resurrection strong enough that he thinks any day here could be my last day. But he's right in the middle of a religious sect of people who loathe Jesus and him. Yep. But he, he said he's got about well, five two. bullets in, in in the chest and he's still kicking. That's a good sign. Yeah, well, that's what I thought. I think they I think they may be right. God's got some use for him yet. Well, you know, the one of the things that I love about this, a lot of times people I, I met with a guy uh, just this past week and he was from the Northeast originally. And he said something really interesting. He was a big fan of our show. And, you know, he was telling me why. But he said he was telling me about his own background. But I found this to be fascinating. He said. You know, in our home, we went to church, you know, mass for them every every week. He said, but in our home, we never prayed. We never talked about the Bible. It, you know, we never had community was the way he described it as a family. He said, we went, you know, it was, it was almost like it, it wasn't a punch card, but it felt that way. But, but it was never real to it. So then he happened to cross our show as an adult. And he said, the first thing I noticed about your family, it was the community of aspect. He said, and, and of course, you prayed on the show. You talked about the Bible quite frequently, even during episodes. And he was just drawn to that. And so it got me thinking about how sort of we came to love the scriptures themselves. I mean, I remember us growing up, Jason, you and I spent a lot of time with dad's parents, our grandparents, and they would always have the Bible out. And they would just be reading it. And then we were just kids, you know, we were there and we began to engage in discussion with our grandparents about the scripture. And you do the same thing now. When we have a gathering, dad usually gets his Bible out or quotes a verse. We did this just recently. We're all together at Thanksgiving and Christmas and gives us a little biblical charge, you know, and there's all the grandkids listening. So you think about that same generational passing along of the stories, which gave us the Bible itself and the Holy Spirit was doing it was the th- same thing that really our particular family, I think, gave us that love for Scripture. You know, I mean... I think, I think the so. people that argue against the Bible and, and Christianity, they haven't really read the Bible. I mean, when I first considered this, I thought, well, I'm going to read this Bible and try to get around it because I thought it was a collection of fairy tales. I mean, because deep down I wanted to do whatever the heck I wanted to do. So I, you know, I was young coming up. I saw, you know, you change your life, Phil, but I was like, 
I mean, how do you know which religion is right? There's hundreds, if not thousands. Everybody has different interpretations. And But the more I study, once I started that, trying to prove it wrong, I was just shocked at how geographically, historically, even from a science perspective, just how solid and accurate this book is, you know, archaeology. I mean, everywhere I went, I was like, huh, wow, huh. <laughs> I, and then when you see how good as far as, you know, nothing that Jesus Christ represented on earth, nothing was bad. Nothing. So, but people always, they they... People who are against the Bible, they tie all these wars to religion and all, but people do that. You know, the spiritual forces of evil do that. When you just take what he represents and what he said, it's all good. Everything's good. That's right. You got four books there to choose from, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. I mean, and everybody would agree that it's all good, even people that don't believe. It's like, is it a good idea, you know, not to murder your neighbor or, you know, not to... That's why Peter said, you remember from the baptism of John how Jesus went around doing good and delivering all those who were under the control of the evil one. That basically is what he did, went around doing good. I tell people all the time, just when you say, well, you must walk as Jesus did, I said, all he's saying is you get up in the morning and you go around wherever you're going and you do good for crying out loud. How hard could it be? That's right. Yeah, that makes me think of the the last verse in the book of John is an interesting verse because when you start thinking the Bible's a big book, and it is, and there's only four letters about Jesus, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but John, I mean, I think this is kind of a humorous statement, but it makes you realize on what could have been written. He says, Jesus did many other things things as well if every one of them were written down i suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written (laughs) i mean it's not that we got everything he's capable of or he did when you when you're a supernatural being you created everything you can do all these things that we would deem impossible really impossible he can do create man from dust yeah. You know, et cetera, et cetera. Well, you, the, the world is not big enough to hold the books that, that's why heaven and the eternal life is so intriguing to me because people are like, what are we going to do? Oh, we, you're not thinking big enough. <laughs> yeah, you know, if we can't, if there's not enough room to hold the books on what he's capable of, well, the same thing applies to what we'll be able to do in the next life. Right. We're just with our little finite brain. It's hard. beyond comprehension. Yeah, it's hard yeah. to get an image of God. That's why there's so much argument about the Bible and God, because people really can't relate. That's why you had to become a human that's in right. Jesus. You start trying to relate, you're going to start arguing because your mind can't compute. And that's when you get into all the things that we're going to talk about next time about How did God create this? How old is the earth? And all these things that we try to figure out. Why does this work this way? Because our finite mind just can't grasp it. That's why he had to become a human. And that's why at some point God knew that what he provided would be enough. Because people say, well, what if there's more? Well, there's John just said there's more. Oh, way more. But, But 66 books condensed into one narrative was enough to tell the whole story. And you think about Jesus, you, you mentioned that. I mean, John made that statement, which is, you're right, it's almost like, it's almost, you know, hyperbole comical. Because yeah. you think about it, Jesus was only here 33 years. Mm-hmm. And he only did ministry for three. I mean, yep. the first 30 are kind of a mystery. We don't know because he was a rabbi. You know, you don't know much about well, him. Well, that's, to- that's what's so annoying to me. You know, people, especially in the religious world, they stay away from Revelation. Because they're like, what in the world? Or you have these crazy ideas. You know, people read the book of Revelation, they're like, whatever that is, you know, I'm out. Because it scares them, they don't know what it is. But most people say, and you've heard me say this before, it's a pet peeve of mine. They call it Revelations. People say, I was reading over in Revelations. It's like all these things are going to happen. But it's actually Revelation. And it the first three One. verses says whose it is, it's Jesus. Right. There's nothing to be scared of. You know, whoever coined that phrase about Revelation was right. It's pretty simple when you just look at the bare facts. There's two teams, God's team, the other team. God's team wins. Don't be stupid. 
Get on the right team. It, it wins, even though it looks like it may not be winning because there's martyrs. The evil one is is and they're killing. battling the Roman Empire. Yeah, at the time. I mean, yeah. okay, yeah. But you just think about it when you're following and serving a being that proved death is not a problem. Get on his team. Yeah. <laughs> Put your faith and trust in him. I mean, Which, that, by the way, that same simple logic does pretty well in our current struggle. Yeah. You know, we in this cultural battle, and we think, oh, no, what's going to happen? It's like, well, there's two teams. <laughs> yeah, that's right. There's good and there's evil. Yeah, it's and, interesting. In the first paragraph of Revelation, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants. Opening line, what must soon take place? Yeah. That's, that's once. This is fixed to happen shortly. It's at hand. Then he said he made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testified to everything he saw, that is, the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Blessed is the one who reads the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear it and take it to heart what is written in it, because the time for these things to happen is near. What if you say the first two, the first paragraph, what I'm fixing to relay to you, John said, this this is fixing to happen quickly. And, and he wrote to seven you churches. You would think you wouldn't be going way start predicting the future in the book of Revelation if you read that first paragraph. Oh, that's what I'm saying. Right. There's been more books written. And, and I tell people, because they're like, well, what's all that about? And I'm like, it, two-thirds of the book of Revelation is other verses in the rest of the Bible. That's right. People are like, what? Yeah. It, it was... <laughs> He just took it from, you know, somewhere else. But when you get it all together in that what they call apocalyptic writing, where it's more a picture than the words, which is what I think is cool about the Bible. You got some books that are written like a letter, like like a book. Then you have Revelation. It's written in a picture form. It's giving you a picture. So what we do is we look at a just imagine a painting and you take one little aspect of the painting and try to figure out yep. what the heck's that that's about instead of getting the grasp of it, which is, oh, you win just like you do in the other 65 books. Yep. Well, whatever this is relating to and to those seven churches in the in the book of Revelation, they win in Jesus. That's it. You lose without him. And there's poetry, there's history. I mean, the Bible itself contains so many different genres that people love, and and yeah, I even love like Psalms, you know, it's just such Proverbs, a, yeah. just it, it's so unique how it's written. And it's, look, there's so many wise sayings in Psalms and Proverbs that you hear in movies that you hear people say. They don't realize it's in the Bible. I've been reading them lately. The first five, six chapters of Proverbs, it's the greatest bunch of bits of information as far as wisdom and. Uh, application of the scriptures yep. and how you live and fear of God, the beginning of well, wisdom, you know. If you Don't want, be a fool, say. You want, to, you want to make America moral again, yeah. study the Proverbs. Yeah, <laughs> yeah even, Start even that the kid. Song of Solomon, people, they read that, you know, kids snicker. It's talking about, you know, sex and women's breasts and, you know, there'll be people, you know, saying, oh, I need to read the book of Song of Solomon. What they forget, I mean, God. Made us male and female. It, That's right. Sex was his idea. It, it's a beautiful thing. If you want to make you America know. moral again, Al, don't listen to sneaky Joe Biden. <laughs> listen, <laughs> listen to Solomon. <laughs> That's right. Well, there you go. We've come full circle on this episode. We started with Sleepy Joe. We ended with Sneaky Joe. Uh, but looking at the Word of God, and that's what we're going to be doing uh, on the podcast. And so, you know, we're unashamed. Uh, that's the name of the podcast, Unashamed with Phil Robertson. So, we want you to know as we sort of dive into the scripture uh, and, and span uh, all of these different stories that it really does come back to that simple truth uh, week in and week out. So uh, next time uh, we're going to look at the beginning. Today we kind of looked at the end. We're going to go back and uh, and show exactly how God did some of the things that uh, that he promised and also that uh, that really have are life-changing for us. So we hope it is for you. I hope you're enjoying the podcast. You can subscribe on iTunes and Spotify, YouTube, Facebook. Uh, we're getting a lot of good feedback from you guys out there. We appreciate that. Uh, you can rate us on iTunes, which will help that search engine so folks can look for us and find us. Uh, Blaze Media, you can always go to blazemedia.com or blazetv.com and, and get us as well. So uh, next time we'll dive in and go a little deeper. Mm-hmm.